Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Larry Webb, and I'm the district director for the for SBA's Washington Metropolitan District Conference. I would like to welcome everyone to another SBA Elevating Small Business Series event. Today, we are celebrating LGBTQ plus Pride Month and the innumerable contributions that we have made to the U.S. economy. This event is being recorded and will be made available after the event. It is my pleasure and honor to lead today's discussion. But first, let me share a few details about my background. As District Director of WMATO, I lead a dynamic team that provides business development services, training and support to entrepreneurs and partner organizations throughout the District of, the District of Columbia, Northern Virginia, and suburban Maryland. The Washington Metropolitan District Office manages SBA's largest portfolio of participating firms in our 8A business development program. My professional background is varied. It includes work as a labor and employment attorney, where I was responsible for training and advising SBA's management on employment, labor performance, and disciplinary matters. I also served as a senior legal counsel for the agency, where I chaired the Fraud, Waste, and Abuse Task Force and implemented public facing enforcement reporting. Before joining the SBA, I served as the Assistant Director of Law for the City of Cleveland, working as a civil litigator for the city's self-sustaining business enterprises. I had the privilege of helping the Office of Equal Opportunity streamline and bolster its enforcement procedures during, that, during my tenure there. One of the things I'm most proud of, however, is being the founder and executive director of an organization called Blackout Unlimited. Blackout Unlimited was um, Ohio's first, and to my knowledge, only same gender loving organization representing the African American community in Cleveland. And it's through this work that I recognize the vital importance of small businesses and of underserved communities. LGTP, LGTQ plus businesses in the United States contributed an estimated $1.7 trillion to America's economy, creating thousands of new jobs each year, and the SBA celebrates this community's innovators and entrepreneurs who provide essential services and diversify our communities. SBA, SBA is proud to support the LGBTQ plus business community. Our network of LG, LG, uh, LGBTQ plus businesses aims to provide focus on economic empowerment in this community by providing access to SBA's programs and services. We conduct outreach to be more inclusive of business owners, regardless of their identity. And our staff welcomes and recognizes the importance of greater inclusion at all levels and in all communities. In addition, a number of SBA district offices have strategic alliances, MOUs as it were, with LG LGBTQ plus business community including the Greater Houston LGBT Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Seattle Business Association, the Nashville LGBT Chamber of Commerce, and the Wisconsin LGBT Chamber of Commerce, to name a few. Some of today's audience members may not know that they can certify as LGBTQ plus owned businesses through the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce, which offers certifications um, for business owners. We will discuss this more with our panelists, Justin, co-founder and president of the chamber. But before we introduce our panelists, we have a pre-recorded message from SBA Administrator Guzman. Let us take a listen. Ms. Guzman, the SBA Administrator, LGBTQ plus Pride Month is important to the SBA as it's our chance to celebrate the incredible entrepreneurial talent in the LGBTQ plus community and all that they do to create the tens of thousands of jobs uh, and grow our economy with $1.7 trillion in economic output, building on the fabric of our main streets, our innovation hubs, and our manufacturing centers across the country. Great small business owners like Rachel Kallenberg of Pizza Corello in Gillette, Wyoming, who's joining us today for today's celebration, but also to share her own entrepreneurial journey, which I know will be inspirational. 
you know, Pride Month is a celebration, but it's also a reminder of all that we're still fighting for to ensure equity of opportunity in entrepreneurship in this country. We must stand with our LGBTQ plus businesses as we all benefit with their successes. And under President Biden's leadership, we've made increasing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility our business. Working together, we will build the connections to ensure equitable access. So I'd also like to give a great thanks to one of our key SBA partners, Justin Nelson, the co-founder and president of the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce, who's joining us to amplify the resources of the federal government to help more entrepreneurs access their American dream of business ownership, which is what the SBA is all about. We want to ensure there's connections to capital, to market and revenue growth opportunities and networks of support, because those are more critical now than ever before. All of our small businesses, especially those facing historic barriers and discrimination, need support in today's COVID disrupted economy where inflationary pressures, a tight job market and new ways of doing business are challenging our entrepreneurs at new levels. We have work ahead of us, but I have confidence in our small businesses with their trademark grit and determination to help us deliver a strong and stable economy. And know that President Biden and Vice President Harris have made it a top priority to address these economic challenges, lowering costs for American families and tackling inflation. We do have a strong economic foundation, thanks to the President's American Rescue Plan. We've battled COVID, yielded an incredible economic recovery, and a small business boom. And I know many of your businesses were transformed with the $1.2 trillion in relief SBA provided through PPP, COVID Idol, the restaurant program, and many other grant programs at the SBA. And now as we work towards creating stable and steady growth that works for working families and small businesses, uh, we know that our entrepreneurs are gonna be critical players. They are the giants in our economy. And it is our small businesses that will help us ensure we can build our economy back better. For example, with the historic $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure law, the investment in our roads and bridges that will strengthen commerce and lower supply chain costs and it should mean contracts for your businesses. And it's our small businesses that's going to, are definitely going to be the ones who help us make more in America. They do make the products that we depend on every day, uh, which is why we hope to see Congress move forward on the Manufacturing and Bipartisan Innovation Act to help us do just that. Our small businesses will help us deliver that strong economy. And so during Pride Month, we are joining together today to make sure that we share the incredible resources that the SBA has to offer our LGBTQ plus entrepreneurs so that they can start, grow, and build resilient businesses and communities. So thank you as well to SBA's great mission leader, Larry Webb, who's joining us to now lead us in this next segment, the panel discussion. Uh, Larry is our Washington DC district director and we have incredible leadership teams across the country that are great resources to you. Uh, you know, I know that uh, you'll enjoy getting to know him as well as our great panelists, Rachel, Rachel and Justin, uh, to talk more about the resources that are available. The bottom line really is that SBA wants to be a part of your team as you build your business. And that's what we're going to do today is start to connect you to the resources that you need to make sure that you can survive and thrive into the future. So thanks for joining us and thanks for making the SBA a part of your team. Thank you, Administrator Guzman, for those kind words. Um, and now to our panelists. Um, I'd like to introduce um, both of our panelists and then give them a moment or two um, or three um, to discuss their backgrounds, um, how they got here today, and then we'll have um, sort of our fireside chat and ask them some questions. Um, but first, um, I'd like to introduce um, Justin Nelson, co-founder and president of the LG LGBT um, Chamber of Commerce, and Rachel Pellenberg, um, I'm sorry, forgive me, co-owner of Pizza Corello from Gillette, um, Wyoming. Um, welcome both of you. Um, Rachel, as our small business owner, um, how about we go with you first? There we go, Rachel. 
<laughs> well, thank you. First and foremost, thank you so much. I am so honored to be participating on this panel today. Um, my background is actually in environmental studies and nonprofit administration. I received a bachelor's degree from the University of Montana in Missoula um, many years ago now. Um, but in 2011, I met my partner in 2006, so we've been together 16 years. In 2011, as Wyoming was seeing an economic downturn, um, my partner was a full-time ceramic artist and she had an idea at a festival uh, that we were at trying to sell her pottery that um, she always struggled between the kitchen and the pottery studio. And she said, wouldn't it be amazing if we could have um, a food cart that we could go to events and and then you know I could make pottery in the winter and do the food cart in the summer at the festivals. Uh, so we kind of started there in 2011, September of 2011. We built our company from the ground. We had $400 in our savings account, uh, which was not much to start a business on. We went to all kinds of different resources. Um, eventually ending up just kind of having to use that $400 to get a $4,000 business loan so we could at least buy the materials to build a wood-fired pizza oven on a trailer, uh, which was where we started our company. After about six months of building the trailer, we finally, for the first time, Ariane was able to make the very first pizza at Pizza Corello. Um, I, at the time, was working a couple of jobs to support our household. Um, but since then, we have persevered and evolved from this little food cart concept to now we have a 150 to 200 seat restaurant uh, in Gillette, Wyoming. That's kind of a real quick and dirty about Pizza Crow. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, Justin, would you like to tell our audience a bit about the, the chamber and what you do? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Larry, for inviting us to be a part of this dialogue. Good to spend time with you, my friend. And I have to say, as a fellow Wyomingite, I've, I've been in D.C. now almost 30 years, but I always say you can take the boy out of Wyoming, but you can't take the Wyoming out of the boy. So I was thrilled to see that we'd be partnered up with Rachel on uh, today's dialogue. And that story you just told inspires me and really inspires why we started the chamber. It's to reach these entrepreneurial dreams. And I think about it as the young gay kid in Wyoming that didn't have a lot of role models, didn't have a lot of uh, places to go and and really find community. And it's something that we've really tried to build through NGLCC. So I have mad respect for you and your partner, Rachel, and what you're doing and living out that dream in, the, in our, both our home state of, of Wyoming. Uh, so I am Justin Nelson. I'm co-founder and president of the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce. NGLCC for short. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, and our organization uh, represents the interest of the 1.4 million businesses owned by LGBT people in this country. And as Larry mentioned in his intro, we have a combined economic impact of about 1.7 trillion on the US economy. We work with 54 state and local affiliate chambers of commerce across the country. We now have 23 globally representing 40 countries on five continents. Uh, we were founded in November of 2002, so we're working on our 20th anniversary this year, which is exciting. And we now work with over 400 corporate partners that are looking to add LGBT-owned companies to their diverse supply chain. So buying products and services from LGBT-owned companies and a growing list of state, local, uh, and some federal agencies that are now accepting of our certification so that we can truly empower LGBTQ people through economics. We believe to reach full equality, you have to have equity. And to have equity, you have to have opportunity. And that's what we stand for at NGLCC. So I look forward to the dialogue today and talking much more about that. But that's sort of the 30,000 foot uh, view. Thank you, Justin. Um, equity and opportunity. Right, right off the top. That's that's what we're here to talk about today is equity and opportunity. Um, I would be remiss, and I think that the administrator would be um, sad if I didn't talk about um, some of the opportunities and, and resources that the SBA provides, and then I'm going to get into um, some of the questions. So for those of you, those of you in the audience that do not know, um, the SBA provides um, three basic services, um, access to capital, um, access to government contracting, and access to counseling. Um, 
I have been known to say, and I will say again today, I actually believe that our counseling services are the most important services that we provide. They, they do not get the biggest splash and they do not necessarily uh, make people's eyes uh, glitter <laughs> when I say that um, because people want to know where the money is. Um, but I am of the mind that um, you do not, um, we are not able to take um, advantage, small business owners across the nation, of those contracting and, 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 and access to capital opportunities if we are not ready and we are not prepared. And so the, the counseling services that we provide can help you get your business plan set up, can help you figure out when it's time to, to grow your business, can help you decide when it's time to um, get a 504 loan, um, to grow into your own business, uh, another business space. Um, they can also help you with social media and financing and what have you, because what I know is that in order to get that, that first loan from a lender, you have to be ready. Um, and so just wanted to put that out there early on. Um, those are the services that we provide. Please go to sba.gov um, and then click on the link at the top of your page that says local assistance, put your zip code in, and that will provide you with all of the resources that are provided within your geographic area. So with my plug out of the way, um, I will um, turn it over back to um, our panel and my first question. And so my first question for, for um, I, we'll start with Justin and then uh, we'll have Rachel chime in. Um, my first question is, are there government and private sector resources and programs our audience should consider when starting and growing their businesses? And that's for, that's for you, Justin. Yeah, Larry, absolutely. And you mentioned a couple of them there. I mean, I often think that the SBA is sometimes one of the best kept secrets when it comes to small business. And I specifically think that for LGBTQ small business. And I mean that because historically we have been sort of left out of the dialogue in the federal government. Now, really, when President Obama, Vice President Biden were in place, we started a tremendous partnership and we really started to expand those resources and education out across across the country through our affiliate chambers and through your district offices. Uh, but there are a number of things. I think that number one thing a business sh should do is visit sba.gov. There are a number of different things from the, the mentoring to loan activity. You know, there's a, just a plethora of resources there that people, most people still today don't know about. That's number one. Number two, I think any business, and especially those that are diverse, and by that I mean uh, ethnic minority, women, people with disabilities, LGBTQ, uh, veterans, uh, all of our segments have national certification. So we are the certifying body for LGBT owned businesses. There are other organizations that we work closely with that certify other segments. And there are a series of benefits that come with being certified. Now, the reality is we don't get a contract for you, but we are the entree to that. I like to say we're the, the cleats that are going to help you run the race, right? We're going to get you to the starting line. You still have to have a quality product at a competitive price. But there are companies that are out there that are looking to do business with you, not despite the fact that you're LGBTQ, but because you are. Now, that doesn't mean you're just going to get the contract there again. You've got to have the right product, the right price. But there are also a number of grant programs that happen with Fortune 500 companies, a number of mentorship programs. Uh, we also run an executive uh, leadership and capacity building program for LGBT business enterprises. I'll refer to those the rest of the call as LGBTBEs. There are a number of different things that are happening there. A lot of grant programs. We teamed up with uh, several of our corporate partners to do grant programs for those businesses hit hardest by COVID to the tune of about $2 million that we've given away and specifically a program for businesses like Rachel's that by the end of next month, we'll have given one and a half million dollars to LGBTQ and allied businesses hit hard by COVID. So I think it's also about doing your research about looking at organizations, who are they partnered with? Some of it's just, you know, good old uh, beating the streets to see what's out there, but a lot of times Sometimes you can look and find resources for different companies and different industries, also trade associations and a number of other ways. And, you know, please visit nglcc.org and we have a list of resources on our website as well. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Justin. Rachel, um, as a part of your background, I know that you have been able to take advantage of some of the resources that SBA has been able to provide. Can you share with our audience how what those resources were and how they helped your business? You bet. I would say over the last 11 years, um, the SBA has been one of the largest resources we've used. Um, in addition to local community members and things like that. But for the SBA right away, the first in September of 2011, we went to our local SBA and said, hey, we have this idea. And um, our representative at the time uh, was somebody we had known for a while. And she said, you know what? I just got back from a conference where all we were talking about was food carts. It was, you know, the new craze. And and I think at that time, you know, there weren't necessarily funding opportunities for startups, uh, which was OK. You know, in retrospect, it, it seemed really daunting at the time. Um, but just that encouragement uh, from our local SBA rep was so huge. Um, we said, OK, maybe we don't have that funding option, but that makes us feel like, yes, this is the right thing to do. Um, but that being said, within a few months, she said, here are other resources that are available. OK, maybe we can't provide you money right now, but we didn't have, you know, we have 400 bucks. We didn't have money to hire an accountant to start bookkeeping and and do all of those things. But we did have a representative in Wyoming who I actually spent two afternoons with just over the phone. She taught me how to use QuickBooks. Um, that was such a huge resource and benefit for our company because we didn't have that kind of knowledge before then and um, and then the amount of webinars and resources that our representatives said, oh, hey, here's this thing that could benefit you or this could help you. Um, as the years went on, you know, we just took advantage of every learning opportunity we could through the SBA um, and our local chamber of commerce and, and business organizations and things like that. Um, but when we did finally get to the point where we got into our first sit down restaurant, uh, we used an SBA loan to acquire furniture and, you know, get it set up, you know, with a POS and all of the things that we needed uh, to run a new uh, chapter in our business. Uh, we utilized that program and now five years, six years after that, we're actually utilizing an SBA 504 loan to buy the building that we leased originally. So the SBA has been with us. And again, I take every webinar that is of any interest <laughs> to me. The financial webinars are incredible, um, especially I didn't have a background in finance, but I really found that I enjoyed that a lot. Um, and so any learning opportunity I could take, I did. So the SBA has been a, a huge resource for us throughout the decade that we've run our company. That's great news. I'm happy to hear that. Um, before I go to my next question, I just wanted to mention something, something that, that Rachel said and, and, and Justin alluded to is that, you know, this, this will be my theme. If I have a theme for the rest of this hour, it's going to be um, be ready and to get ready. And so I will pass on some information that, 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 that I was on a panel um, recently and lenders were talking and what they said was you should be talking to your lender right now not the day before you need the loan begin to begin to set up those relationships now and it's like a dentist or a doctor or a restaurant you you may have to go to several you may have to find out the appetite of a particular lender don't you know that's the type of research and shameless plug for the sba our SBA, uh, SBDCs, our Women's Business Centers, our VBOX, et cetera, um, can help you navigate that score. I, I, I don't want to say et cetera, score, and as well as our community navigators can help you navigate those waters. So once again, SBA.gov, local resources, local assistance um, to help you get there. So um, to our second question, what does the landscape look like for LG, LGBTQI plus small businesses and what that want to participate in government contracting space. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll turn that over to, to Justin for the first um, stab at that. Well, I will, I'll say we're working on that. You know, uh, at current, we're not recognized by the federal government, uh, although we are working on that. We do have a series of MOUs that we've put in place and uh, we'll be making a really exciting announcement. I can't make it on this call today, but I'll tell you it's to the tune of about $10 billion in opportunity uh, that will be working with us from a federal government agency standpoint to include certified LGBTBEs 
uh, in the bidding process. That's huge. And I think it's also a major step forward in getting that recognition. Now, the great thing is if you're looking at state and local participation, we've now established partnerships with just about every major uh, city in the country. We have about 28 partnerships uh, with states and municipalities that are looking for LGBT owned businesses as a part of their diverse supply chain. So I think that's incredibly exciting. Uh, we are working hard and frankly, we have an administration uh, and an administrator at the SBA that is that is eager to help find solutions for more uh, inclusive procurement policy. That's a huge, huge uh, step in the right direction. I do want to just say two things I missed in the last question, if you don't mind, Larry, uh, just your partners that you have at the Department of Commerce. If, you know, I know we have sort of seen the soft underbelly of globalization with COVID, and we probably will see some balkanization of economies, but there still is a great opportunity for businesses that are looking to export outside of the United States. 95% of the world's consumers live outside of the United States. So really, unless you are a business like Rachel's, which are vital to the economy and serve a local community uh, in its entirety, you should be thinking not just about the next town or the next state, but who are some of the countries that may be looking for the product or service that you offer. Yeah, there's an amazing program uh, at the Department of Commerce uh, through commercial services. They actually help you find markets that would be open or looking for your particular product or service one step further. And I always say this because we are red-blooded packs tax paying Americans. These are our tax dollars at work. This is a service to you as a taxpayer. There is a product they have gold key where they will actually set up your meetings uh, with end users, distributors, um, importers, and take those meetings with you to make sure you get the most out of them. So not only are there amazing resources at SBA, there's also amazing resources at the Department of Commerce, Commercial Services. And then I won't go too far into it, but to get one step further, there's the Export Import Bank of the United States that can help finance your exports to be able to get into other markets. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for that that um, useful information. Um, I also, uh, and we look forward to that announcement, Justin. Um, I, I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath. Um, in the interim, I would also note that um, our 8A um, business development program um, does allow um, LGBTQI um, uh, business owners to apply for that program. And that is one of the ways in which you can, um, you can take advantage of the government resources as once you get red bellied Americans, um, these are programs that are available to you. Um, there is not a specific, uh, specific carve out, uh, but um, as underserved communities and the LGBTQI uh, community is an underserved community, uh, that is uh, another opportunity for you. So once again, um, uh, do your work, get ready um, and be ready. Um, I will also mention, I mentioned it at the beginning and I'll mention it again, this is recorded. And so if, if we say something and um, you didn't quite catch it, um, this will be up on our YouTube page. And so you can go back and, and listen again. Um, Rachel, uh, what recommendations um, as a, as a uh, restaurant that is uh, now celebrating its 10th anniversary, going on your 12th, <laughs> 11th anniversary, what recommendations would you offer a business owner that's looking to secure capital and financial backing? Well, Larry, I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head that you really do need to be prepared. You need to um, know what you're, what you're wanting or what you're looking for. You also need to know your numbers. Um, you know, I didn't know much about financials, how to read a profit and loss statement or what a balance sheet meant. Um, so find some resources to help you understand. Uh, you know, if you are able to have a bookkeeper or, or an accountant that helps you with your books, know your numbers. Make sure you're talking to them all the time um, so that you're not lost and you don't understand where your business is financially. Um, I think the we were able to procure so much help because I do all of our bookkeeping. So I have a pretty good pulse on where our business is financially uh, and what we need to do. We're also as a small business able to pivot quickly if we see that things aren't working out and oh, this month we lost money and we can't explain why, you know, we can kind of say, okay, great, let's make these changes. Um, so you really need to know your numbers uh, and, and understand what that means. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Justin, did you have anything to add to that? 
um, conversation about um, businesses, owners securing capital or financial backing. Well, I think they should also be looking at other types of investment. Uh, you know, there are different investment funds. We work with a group called Gangels. Uh, they're a group of mostly LGBTQ uh, funders that are looking for particular projects. So depending on what your business is or what your startup is or what level you're at in terms of your funding needs, there are other kinds of, of funding that's available. I'd also say there's um, different kinds of uh, of support available that will help fund your invoices. So we work with Meta, for example, and it's for a very small, small percent of the actualized invoice. They'll front your invoice so you can actually get your cash in the door quicker, which absolutely helps with your ability to land and deliver on the next contract and comes in quite handy for bridge capital. So there's traditional sorts of funding, uh, but also look at, into some other some other items depending on where you are in your funding journey. That's great news. Thank you for that. I learned something about Meta today that I didn't know. So thank you for that, um, Justin. Um, a, a housekeeping note, I have used several acronyms in the last few minutes and um, uh, it's a lot of government speak. So I just wanted to mention a couple and explain what they are and then we'll go to our next question. I mentioned um, WBCs, those are women's business centers. Um, they are funded by the Small Business Administration and they, we have, um, I don't want to misspeak, but I think we've increased them by 40%, I believe, in the last um, two years under this administration. Um, they, like the Small Business Development Centers um, and SPOR, um, as well as BBOC, which is the business um, Veterans Business Outreach Centers um, provide that type of counseling and education um, that uh, that business owners need. Um, and so, I just want to make sure that I gave those names. Um, and so, as you're looking, um, as you go to sb.gov and look at the at the local assistance, you'll see those names um, and those resources in your zip code. Fantastic, um, Justin. For you, um, providing equity for small businesses is a top priority of the SBA. SBA recently formed, um, I should say, relaunched the Council of Underserved Communities, which we call the CUC. Can you give us some insights into what the C CUC is doing right now? Sure, I think to, to the degree that I can share things, I mean, it's all public, all, all of our meetings are public, uh, our deliberations are public. Um, and first of all, thanks. Thanks to Administrator Guzman for reconstituting the council. Uh, it brings together many of us representatives from different diverse constituencies that, um, you know, in many cases have been left behind or marginalized to really take a look at what sort of resources should be made available, what sort of policy recommendations can be made to the SBA and the administration around access and opportunity for diverse business owners. Uh, we actually have our summer meeting coming up next week, which is actually the place that I'm going to share the the big news first, and then we'll <laughs> share it publicly. But I want to I want to be able to to share. It. Yes, yes, at that particular, but you you all will be close to hear it afterwards, but um, it really is remarkable. And the amazing thing about the council is we have divided it up into several subcommittees that are really working on priorities that we can then recommend uh, to the SBA. Uh, I happen to sit on the contracting and purchasing subcommittee, but there's one also on amplification of resources and of course access to capital. You know what's important in that regard. And in fact, we just had one of our joint subcommittee committee meetings yesterday in which some of our priorities on on uh, purchasing really overlap and may better fit on uh, uh, access to capital. Uh, I'm sure everyone on this call knows it, but many people don't know that in 35 states you can still be denied uh, access to credit or access to capital by a fin financial services institution for just being LGBTQ. That should shock everybody. We should have every resource av available for every small business. So that's a priority for us too, is what can we do to see that SBA lenders are adhering to uh, really the president's executive order and desire around inclusive policies. So those are some of the things that the council does, but our hope for this is on the south side of this year's recommendations that we come up with some concrete steps that will actually make opportunity and access to not only SBA resources and access to capital, but contracting more available to America's diverse economy. 
That is excellent um, and and um, sort of breaking news, as it were. So we're looking forward to those recommendations. I personally am looking forward to the amplification um, recommendations as a district director um, because a lot of the resources that we have are 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 great. We just need to get, get that information into the hands of more people so Absolutely. that they can grow, start, and expand their businesses. Um, I saved this question. I didn't want this to be the first question because we've been talking about the pandemic. It seems like every every webinar, you know, that's like the first thing, but it, it is real and it's still going on. So how has the pandemic um, disproportionately impacted LGBTQ plus small businesses and how are they adjusting? Rachel, I'll start with you as a business owner and then um, if you can turn it over to, to Justin, that's what we'll do. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Larry. Um, you know, I feel like the pandemic itself didn't really care about the demographics of business owners. So being um, a queer identified business was maybe less of um, an impact because of COVID. And we were fortunate because of the industry we were in, there were a lot of resources available. So I do feel like maybe the biggest impacts were more um, industry related. However, mm -hmm. that being said, I will say that it seems like, you know, being in customer service, we are seeing a lot of people who are maybe not as kind as maybe we once were. Um, I know we've seen a lot more, um, I don't want to say abuse to our staff, but a lot more rude customers and we're very big on keeping our staff. I've had to kick more people out of the restaurant than we would ever like to, um, but we're not going to allow our staff to be treated poorly um, by anyone. Uh, so I know that that, uh, again, we were fortunate because we had a lot of opportunities for um, assistance, whether that was through the federal level or the state level or a local level. Um, but the attitudes of people have changed so much, and I do Unfortunately, it seems like, you know, we were pretty polarized anyway, but the pandemic and the things that have kind of occurred, you know, in the last few years have really further marginalized, already marginalized groups. And and so I think that's been probably one of the hardest things with COVID. Um, as an industry, we were okay, you know, we made it through it. Um, but, you know, if we could just have a little more kindness, I think that would be helpful. Justin, maybe you've, you work with a lot more businesses. I'm just one business in one industry in one state and one town. But um, Justin, maybe you know more about other businesses and how they've been affected. Well, I think you're uh, spot on on that. I mean, it, it sort of just doesn't discriminate. COVID didn't discriminate. It was really industry heavy. You know, we see a lot of our businesses that are particularly in hospitality, uh, food and uh, food and related services that have you know been decimated. Uh, we also saw, I think, some innovation, which was really uh, exciting. You know, we have a couple of distilleries in our network, actually more than a couple, that really came to uh, the def I guess the the aid the rescue of government agencies and major corporations because if you remember early on uh, you couldn't get hand sanitizer anywhere and of course you weren't selling your booze to the restaurants because they didn't have customers in them so I think the other thing that it did and and I'd hate to say silver lining because I think the whole last couple of years have been awful net net but there were some innovations that came out of it, even for our organization. I think most most businesses experienced five years of digital transformation in 18 months. And if they didn't or they aren't in the process of it today, they're probably still not here. But I do think there are some specific nuances. And um, Rachel, you may be the exception to this because, you know, I, I say this with all due love for for our shared state of Wyoming. It's not the most progressive state. But again, there are 35 states where a business could have gone in. And let's keep in mind when that first tranche of PPP funding came, it went to larger institute went to larger institutions that went to larger as small small and medium sized enterprises. Uh, it didn't go to the micro enterprises and the smallest of the small businesses or those that didn't have large banking relationships. That was a problem. Uh, we rectified that a little bit with CDFIs in the second round. Uh, still keeping in mind that a lot of those small community uh, banks 
uh, have the ability to discriminate against businesses. And unfortunately, we had reports of that. So, you know, in the in the throes of a horrible, horrible time for everybody across the board, the thought that it still crossed someone's mind to discriminate based on the fact that we weren't just business partners, we were life partners is quite sickening. Uh, I'd like to see that rectified. There's some legislation that's out there right now that we fully support that I think could remedy that and the Equality Act and the Ac fair, fair, uh, Access to Fair Credit Act and some others, but those are still there. And I think uh, to Rachel's point, uh, a lot of it was industry related, but um, uh, unfortunately there was some of this marginalization, discrimination, discrimination, polarization that was at play during COVID as well. Thank you. And, and, oh, I'm so sorry, please. Larry. Um, <laughs> please go ahead. No, no, no. It's you. Well, I just wanted to say, you know, Justin, it's so true. We were very fortunate that we had already established really strong relationships with uh, banks in town. And so we did have a lot of support that um, especially much uh, smaller businesses might not have had. Um, and I will say, too, you know, Wyoming, you know, had very different requirements and restrictions than other states did. Um, restaurants in Wyoming didn't have to close completely. They went to take out, uh, but there were lots of states where they, yeah, restaurants had to shut down completely. Other businesses uh, in Wyoming too, you know, hair salons, tattoo parlors, there were some that, you know, had to shut down completely, but because of, you know, the, the laws in Wyoming, we did have a very different landscape navigating COVID for sure. Hey, Larry, can I just add one other thing to here? Absolutely, please. I think one of the interesting things, you know, again, back to the not not calling it silver lining, but the silver lining, um, you know, it also helped us establish a lot of partnerships. And while there, people are more polarized than ever, there's a lot of good out there. And, you know, I said that we were able to establish uh, grant partnerships with a number of our corporate partners and step up and truly help businesses. You know, our partnership with Grubhub, putting in $1.5 million in grants to restaurants hit hardest. LGBTQ owned restaurants hit hardest by COVID was a lifesaver. I mean, these stories, these horrible stories about people losing their life savings or, or having to go into debt or pick between bills or paying their staff. And the, the reality that we could alleviate some of that. We couldn't alleviate all of it, but we've been able to do that. And the exciting thing is we've upped that program for a second year. Uh, so Rachel, I'll, I'll be coming to you to make sure we're getting an application from you. But there was also some really, you know, it showed the ugliest of ugly, but it's also shown the best of the best. Thank you. Thank you both of you for, for sharing your, your experiences, um, uh, both the, the challenging and the uplifting. Um, what barriers are there to businesses to business ownership in the current environment for LGBTQ um, plus owned small businesses? Um, Justin, we'll start with you. What are the, what I mean? You've talked about some of them, the you know, 35 states, etc. Um, are there others? Um, and and how is the chamber you know trying to alleviate those barriers? Well, I think startup capital is always huge. I mean, people beg, borrow, and steal. You go to friends, you cash out retirement, you drain your savings. That's sort of the entrepreneurs, uh, how they cut their teeth. Uh, so, I mean, there's always going to be that particular issue. I think right now our economy is in a drastic change. And I mean that from just how we do business, where we do business, and what we do for business. Uh, automation is here, it's real. Uh, AI is here, it's real. So I think right now to be an entrepreneur, it, it's an interesting time, but there's a lot of opportunity. I go back to the, what I mentioned earlier about the balkanization or what will likely be some balkanization uh, of global economies. Uh, we are going to start making more here in the United States. That's what COVID taught us as well. We can't have a supply chain that is so dependent on everything, literally almost everything being imported in. So, you know, I think if you are looking at manufacturing, if you're looking at other particular industries that may have been quote unquote dead five years ago, they're starting to see signs of life. Now, how do you get into it and what do you bring to the manufacturing world of 2022, 2022, three, four, five, six is what uh, 
entrepreneurs are going to have to decide. And I think the other real challenge right now is not just about starting a business, but it's keeping a business. We have a lot of great, what I would call on, encore entrepreneurs, people that have been in business for many years that are now in antiquated industries. Uh, if you can see the dissipation light blinking, it probably is. You know, there are just things that are falling by the wayside, going the way of the dinosaur. Don't fight tooth and nail. Innovate. Look at what you can do to reimagine. If you're a good entrepreneur, a good business owner, a good manager, you can probably do it in another uh, in another industry and putting those same skills to use. So I think that's what I would encourage people to do is really look at what the next five years look like. And if you're not reaching the age where you're ready to either um, liquidate your business or just retire, you probably should be thinking about how you're going to change what you're doing unless you're in a staple industry like uh, food and food service or uh, transportation, hospitality, those sorts of things. Perfect, thank you. Um, Rachel, um, as a business who once again has been uh, somewhat fortunate, I, I know that these were rough times, but somewhat fortunate um, um, during the pandemic and uh, in the in the years prior to that, uh, what were some of the ways that what was what's some of the advice that you would provide to our audience about overcoming barriers? You know, Larry, I I don't want to get too dark or too down, um, but like Justin mentioned, you know, we do live in a state that is more conservative, and and so if you do live in a place that is uh, more open-minded, a little more progressive, you might not understand what you know where I would be coming from. But you know, we are seeing and having to fight. You know, I I feel like I've been fighting my whole life. You know, to you know for marriage equality, and you know that we're not bad people because of how we identify um, in our personal lives. Um, and I think that we do still fight those stereotypes and, and now misinformation. Um, and, you know, the mission of Pizza Corello is to improve the quality of life for our community um, through thoughtful, creative uh, endeavors um, with, you know, good food and great ingredients and things like that. Um, but sometimes it's hard when you have a portion of your community that feels like you're you have a hidden agenda. Like my agenda is to make our community great. Um, and I think even in small communities, you know, there are so many different groups of people and and, you know, a community, my community might not be the same as somebody, you know, down the street. Um, but, you know, we have to always stand up for what we believe is right um, and have each other's backs. You know, we, Ariane and I kind of grew up in the town where we were, where we started our business in Gillette. Um, so we've known a lot of people there. Uh, you know, I've lived in Gillette, moved and come back a couple of different times. So we've known lots of people. We were able to build our tribe. Um, and those are the people and organizations that we work with who have our backs. You know, if we get a comment on social media that's not nice uh, or kind, um, we do have our tribe is fierce and they come out and say, you know what, fine, maybe that wasn't awesome, but, you know, we donate to organizations and, and so they've got our back. So I do feel like probably one of the things that has made us the most successful um, are our community partnerships and our tribe of people that help just keep us strong. Um, you know, having a business, regardless of how you identify, is full of obstacles and full of um, times when you're going to be down and you're going to be like, oh, why are we doing this? This is so hard. Um, and you just have to have the tenacity to keep going and know that what you're doing um, is the best for and that you're doing the best that you can. Um, so you've got to stay strong and and rely on those people in your community and the people in your family and in your world who have your back and uh, keep you going. Um, so building those community partnerships uh, in the beginning, of course, we didn't have money, so it was time. You know, if we had a weekend where we weren't out making pizza, you know, we would go help an organization if we could. Um, now that we're in a different financial position, we don't have the time as much, but we do have money now that we can say, hey, nonprofit organization who helps battered women, here's a donation for, you know, to help with your services. Um, so it's really supporting your community and and letting them support you too. 
That's perfect. I, I, perfect. Thank you so much for that. Um, Justin, did you, uh, that's, that's a hard act to follow, but I don't know if you have some other um, thoughts um, on um, how to, how, how businesses should think about overcoming those barriers um, that inherently are going to be there and then some that are going to be there simply because of the identity. Yeah, well, first of all, well said, Rachel, uh, very well said. And, you know, it's not just the rural areas that that have that issue. We did a grant event in Times Square. We gave away $100,000 to seven restaurants on Friday to kick off a of Friday in New York City. While I was up speaking, had a lunatic trying to rush the stage. So it's happening everywhere, unfortunately. Um, and we all should be aware of it and, and hopefully our decision makers are, are are becoming more aware of it and, and will take action. I think the thing that a lot of business owners, um, I guess the advice I would give is don't play the victim in this. You've got to persevere and you've got to realize that you're going to have headwinds no matter what. And the moment that you decide that what the outside world is throwing at you is how you're going to begin to see yourself and believe or your capabilities, you're defeated. It's not worth it. And you know, to, to the finding the tribe comment, I can't agree more with that. Get with the group, you know, believe in your customers and your team. I mean, our team is so vital to us. You know, I would uh, I would crack skulls. You know, they're they're they they mean the world to us, and uh, our partners do. And I would encourage a business if you're LGBT owned out there, if you sell a product or service, um, get certified. Go to nglcc.org, find out how you can get certified. You've got an opportunity with 400 of the top multinational corporations, not to mention meeting a nationwide, in fact, global network of fellow LGBTQ entrepreneurs that just want to help you see, succeed. You know, we have our conference coming up in August, the second through the fifth in Vegas. There's nothing like it, Larry. I mean, people are there, you know, they might be your competitor out in the day, day to day. The energy of helping you succeed and just wanting to see you succeed is just, it's everywhere. It's electric. And I can't say enough about just not don't don't give in, don't give up and investigate every possible scenario. Reach out, get involved. Rachel's point was so well taken about getting involved with other organizations in a community. Not only is it the right thing to do, but those people, you know, could be customers or could be entree to a company that they work with that could help you close that next big deal. That's perfect. Yeah. No, Rachel, I, I, I'm going to move quickly to my next question, but you touched on something that I've been saying, um, and I, I wish I could just tape you in, and, 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 and cue you up every time I am um, in front of a, a group of business owners. But, you know, small business, we talk about the economy of small businesses. We talk about the numbers and the and the, the number of people hired, the, the 1 point trillion. I believe that 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 Small businesses or small businesses are economic leaders, but they're also cultural leaders. The culture of a community is in great deal um, supported or destroyed by, you know, small businesses. How you how you treat your customers, how you treat your staff, the people that you hire, um, you know, hiring in your community. And so we are, yes, you know, small businesses are there for all the economic ends, but it's also about the culture. And so creating that tribe and having a tribe to support you is is fantastic so in our last few minutes i will ask um our last question of the day um and uh, rachel we'll start with you and 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 justin you can close us out here um what is the one goal that you have for your respective organization or business to support lgbtq plus small businesses as we advance what's your hope what's your goal you know i think that's that's hard because sometimes it feels like it's such a huge task just to keep going, you know, keep your own business going. Um, you know, I was talking with my partner about this question um, because, you know, I think we get so focused on on keeping our doors open um, that it's hard to sometimes advocate for others. Um, but, you know, we said, let's, you know, what we do is we keep our integrity. We be good role models. Um, we utilize those other businesses whenever possible. You know, if if I've got uh, an LGBT community member down the street, I'm going to them first. Um, I'm, you know, we're supporting P flag. We're supporting, you know, the organizations that are supporting our community, you know, on a local level. 
uh, and then a state level and then the national level. So, you know, I think kind of having been for a lack of a better term, the poster children, um, we have to be good examples. We have to use our integrity. And you know, when we deal with competition, we always say it doesn't matter what they're doing. We have to focus on what we're doing. Um, so we'll do everything that we can to make sure that we're supporting other LGBT members of our community. Um, I do think, you know, that sometimes, you know, employing them is is sometimes the only thing we can do, but at least we're offering a supportive environment that's safe for them to be at. Um, Justin, maybe you have other ideas, especially as an organization that that does business and LGBTQIA plus advocacy. Well, I'll answer it two ways. My my hope is that I would put my organization out of business or that we wouldn't have a need for it anymore. The reality is that's probably not going to happen. So I would say my goal is to ensure access, equity, and opportunity for every LGBT mm. entrepreneurs, every LGBT entrepreneur that is looking to grow or scale their enterprise, and that we are just, um, you know, accepted for the economic contributors that we are. You know, we've mentioned the $1.7 trillion, but put that in perspective, we'd be the 10th largest economy in the world if all LGBTQ entrepreneurs were our own country, the 10th largest economy in the world. So, you know, who doesn't want to deal with the 10th largest economy? So that's my goal. That's my hope. And it's been a delight being a part of this dialogue. We appreciate our partnership with SBA. You all are tremendous partners. Uh, and Rachel, when I come back to see mom and dad this summer, I'm going to make the drive to Gillette because I want some of that pizza. <laughs> Dustin, please do let me know when you're in the area. I would love to meet you person in person. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, this brings us to the close of today's discussion. Um, I would like to thank um, our fantastic panel, uh, Justin and Rachel. Um, it has been a pleasure getting to know you today and you know this week. Um, and I too have not been to Wyoming, um, but I now know what city I need to go to and where I need to get some pizza. So thank you. Um, I look forward to um, I look forward to that trip. Um, it's been a pleasure moderating today. Um, as we continue to uplift um, LGBTQ entrepreneurs in their quest to maintain and grow their businesses across America. This webinar has been recorded as we discussed earlier and will be available on the SBA's YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Please join us in August for another Elevating Small Business series as we celebrate rural entrepreneurs. And for more information on SBA services, as I mentioned earlier, please go to sba.gov. Um, and last but not least, have a great day and happy pride. Thank you so much for attending today. Have a great day.